Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar of the Community of Practice for the Ecosystem-Based Adaptation. Um, could you please let me know if you can hear well? Uh, you can write in the chat. So, okay, perfect. Um, well, um, welcome once again to our webinar on demonstrating evidence of ecosystem-based adaptation in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Lili Lieva and I will be moderating the webinar. Um, for those of you who have not used the platform, the voice boxer platform, you can choose the language to listen. So you can listen either in English or in Spanish. You can see um, a little button on the, uh, on the lower side of the screen uh, where it's written your language. So please choose the language you prefer. If you have any technical problem, um, please click on the question mark on the lower left end of the screen so there is a technical support um, who are going to go through the problem and, and resolve it. As well, if by any chance there is a, um, the audio problems or the screen freezes, uh, please refresh the page. As well, I would recommend you to minimize a little bit your screen so you could see the full versions of the presentations. Well, um, with this, uh, I would like to start our webinar. Um, oh, all right. Now I see that you actually cannot hear me. Um, just a minute. Right. Um, just a second. Could you let me know if you can hear me now? Okay. Yes. All right. I hope that you all can hear me now. Um, well, I would, I would continue. Please let me know if, again, uh, any problem occurs with the audio. In any case, you can try first to refresh the page, and maybe this would be solving it. So, um, well, my name is Lili Lieva, just for some of you who haven't heard. Um, the previous part of the introduction. Um, the ecosystem-based community of practice is a United Nations Environment Initiative. Um, it is through the program REGATA. It is a regional plat portal for technology transfer um, and action on climate change. The initiative is being implemented in collaboration with Practical Action. So we are very pleased uh, to share with you in this webinar uh, 10 excellent case studies from Latin America and the Caribbean demonstrating how ecosystem-based adaptation works, the benefits it generates for communities and for ecosystems, and as well the opportunities to integrate these solutions into a larger planning um, either for adaptation to climate change or also for development. So the 10 case studies we are about to share with you and we are very glad to have um, the presenters with us are 
finalists uh, from our regional contest on demonstrating best or effectiveness and based case studies of ecosystem-based adaptation in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. And we have the chance to present uh, them through two webinars. It's the current webinar and as well another webinar we would have on the 11th of July. In this webinar uh, we are very glad to um, present you five of the case studies of the finalists. Um, it's, um, these case studies come from Costa Rica, from Peru, from Brazil, from Grenada and from Cuba. So it is uh, my pleasure um, well, first to let you know that if, um, if you have any questions during the presentations, could you, could you please um, keep your questions for the end of all presentations. We would have a session um, on questions and answers, so it is where you would be able to ask each presenter um, a question. Just a second. Yeah. So, um, it is my pleasure to give the word to our first presenter, Monica Garcia Aguilar. Um, she is from the Polytechnic University Madrid and um, the, the case study is being presented on behalf of the university as well as the National Institute of Development in Costa Rica and the Spanish Agency for International Cooperation for Development. The case study that Monica is going to present is Proposals for Ecosystem-Based Adaptation to Climate Change for the Bribri Indigenous Territory. Just one second. por favor de un, un momento estamos teniendo un par de problemas técnicos un momento por favor vamos a solucionar algunos problemas técnicos y regresamos con la presentación un momento por favor Taking just several seconds to repair the audio. Thank you. I would give now the the word again to Monica. 
Many apologies for that. Monica, it's uh, your word again. Thank you. We are trying to solve the problem uh, on the audio, so I would give just some uh, minutes to Monica to resolve the, the problem with our colleagues from Voicebox there. Well, we, meanwhile, um, I would like to share with you that, um, as I mentioned, uh, we would have the opportunity to hear all of the ten finalists from our regional contest on ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, in this case, we would have the, the case studies and five case studies in this webinar and we would also share a publication where you would find more examples of or more details of each case study uh, where you can understand um, in more details how the process of planning and implementing and the best um, lessons learned in the whole process um, has taken place. I would, um, let me see, so I would give the word once again to Monica. Hello once again. Uh, we are trying to resolve some technical problems that we have. So I would like to ask you, if possible, to have a little patience and just um, stay with us for some minutes. While, um, while Monica uh, is trying to resolve the problem, uh, we can follow up with other uh, other presenter. Our presenter um, from Brazil, uh, it is Jennifer Biester, and she can present us her case study on a strategy for capacity building in ecosystem-based adaptation in the Atlantic forest. At this time, I would need to go through the different presentations, so please excuse me that we are changing the order uh, until I reach her presentation.
here we are um, at the presentation of Jennifer Pissier. She's an environmental analyst from the Brazilian Ministry of Environment. And she, her case study was presented as well with Patricia Betty from the German Cooperation Agency. So I would give the word to Jennifer now um, while we are resolving the problems of the other presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, so uh, I'm here with Patricia Betti. She is a technical advisor from GIZ. And we are going to present our strategy for capacity building in ecosystem-based yeah, ecosystem adaptation in the Atlantic Forest. Some people are having problem hearing me. <clears throat> Can I go on or do you want me to wait a moment? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I suggest that every participant refreshes their the website and then try again. Um, we are hearing Jennifer, but um, maybe some of you. Uh, you don't need to log in or log out. It is just about refreshing just to go where the website, the address of the website is and just click refresh. So it, it's not necessary to, to log in. So if you could try again. We are from our side are hearing you, Jennifer. Um, maybe you can continue and then and then see um, how it goes with the audio. Presentation for the people that are listening. So uh, our strategy for capacity building in EBA in the Atlantic Forest uh, was developed by the Biodiversity and Climate Change in the Atlantic Forest Project, that is the project that we work on. Uh, it's coordinated by the Brazilian Ministry of, the, of Environment in the context of the Brazilian-German Sustainable Development Cooperation <clears throat> under the International Climate Initiative of the German Federal Ministry of Environmental, the BMUB. <clears throat> So here we have the three key regions for the project. Uh, you can see in the map. Uh, they are regions of protected area mosaics. The first one is the extreme south of Bahia. The second is the Central Fluminense mosaic in Rio de Janeiro. And the third is the Lagamar mosaic that it's on the south coast of uh, São Paulo and the coast of Paraná. In addition to these three key regions, we also have some capacity building activities in the northeast region of Brazil and also in the Atlantic Forest as a whole at the federal level. And our aim, aim to, uh, with this strategy is to strengthen, uh, strengthen technical and institutional capacities in the project key regions, the three key regions plus the northeast, and also at federal level in the context of the National Adaptation Plan. Uh, we want this to promote the consideration of EBA measures in public policies and also in territorial planning instruments and to communicate and promote the EBA approach. So to address, address these, uh, these goals, we established four components in our uh, strategy for capacity building. The first one is the training of trainers because we wanted uh, people from Brazil 
capable of uh, passing the knowledge of EBA uh, to others. The second component is the EBA appropriating by institutions of reference. The third component is the EBA training itself. Uh, we made this through specific courses of EBA, but also through lectures and uh, awareness activities in different events. And the fourth component is uh, inserting EBA in territorial planning instruments. This component is actually one of the main goals of the Atlantic Forest Project. From 2013 to today, uh, we have offered and designed courses, we elaborated and provided didactic materials, and we also offer to the participants and trainers uh, coaching to help them uh, uh, do their activities on EBA training. Um, several of, of, of our trainers became coaches of the courses that followed, and other trainers uh, started to integrate EBA into public policies and in, into territorial planning instruments. Some of the materials that uh, we elaborated include an EBA handout and briefings, a manual for the trainers, uh, an EBA video, an EBA online learning course that we are developing now, and EBA posters and infographs. Okay, so for each of our four components of this strategy, uh, we, got, we made indicators to measure the progress of the implementation. And also one really important aspect was that we made a plan with spe specific activities, with implementation deadlines, and with clear responsibilities. And this plan was on one of the most important uh, aspects to the success of this strategy. Our courses were evaluated by participants at the end of each course, and we used a tool called the Barometer of Knowledge. This barometer was to evaluate their, the perceptions of the participants on their learning evolution. Uh, we asked the participants about their knowledge on climate change and on EBA at the beginning and at the end of each course, so we could see this evolution. And in all cases, the barometer showed a positive per perception. Um, EBA activities developed by the participants are also monitored with an uh, online survey, with some of these activities being uh, followed by the project in a coaching process. And we are right now organizing our trainers national meeting that are going to happen in two weeks, and we are also, also going to have some uh, monitoring and um, experiences exchange in this, in this event. Here you can see uh, our uh, results, our strategy results. We offered uh, 15 courses. Uh, they started in 2013, and the last one was this year. Of these 15 courses, 11 was methodological courses, that are courses of EBA, and four were, were training of trainer courses. The locations were the three key regions, the Northeast region and also Brasilia at the federal level. And we have 265 participants at the, at the methodological courses and 65 trainers. The participants and the trainers learned about and got the ability to explain the concepts of climate change, adaptation, and EBA, uh, to apply the methodology of inserting EBA in territorial planning instruments and in public policies into their work context, 
so at the municipal, local, state and federal level, and to pass on their knowledge to others, especially in the case of trainers. Our capacity building strategy has demonstrated the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of EBA uh, to uh, increase resilience and adapt adaptive capacity by providing more knowledge about vulnerability and the importance of maintaining ecosystem services, providing collective learning and the capacity to disseminate knowledge, and enhancing and contributing to the increase of local knowledge. At the federal level, we published in 2015 our National Adaptation Plan to Climate Change. Uh, these adaptation plans are made of different sectors, and all the focal points of the, these sectors participated in the trainer of trainers or on our EBA courses. And we established that one of the NAP principles is to promote and integrate EBA across all sectors. And with the help of our capacity building strategy, nine of the 11 NAP sectors included EBA measures as measures to adapt their sectors to climate change. Uh, we had other mainstreaming measures uh, focusing on the consideration of EBA in territorial planning instruments. That is one of our main goals. Uh, and these territorial planning instruments um, are mainly protected areas management plans and different territorial plans at the municipal level. So we learned, we learned that um, one of the most important uh, steps was a sequential logic for our strategy, starting with basic courses and with awareness activities, and adjusting, always adjusting materials accordingly. Um, we made a constant improvement, adapting contents through experiences, so our 2013 courses are really different from the ones that we have now because we made this a process of learning and adapting through our experiences. Also, after every course, we made meetings to discuss the positives and the negatives of each course uh, so we can make this learning process and these, these adaptations. Another adaptation that we made was methodological to the cultural realities of the key regions. So um, some things that worked on the federal level, the courses at the federal level didn't work it in the local level and vice versa. So we made these adaptations. Also, we adapt the technical language to provide the participation of a um, uh, variety of people especially the ones without a specific climate change and EBA knowledge, and you wanted to reach that, that people too. One of the most important aspects was to uh, establish the training of trainers because we didn't have people in Brazil capable to give courses about EBA. So we uh, started training uh, them to do that and the appropriating of EBA, EBA in institutions. Another important aspect was the integration of the capacity building strategy into local processes um, to connect our strategy to our, one of our main goals in the project. Also the elaboration of material in Portuguese with local examples because we had a lot of material from GIZ and with uh, another examples from other countries and we elaborate our material in Portuguese and with local examples. Uh, one of them was our EBA video because we use uh, videos from GIZ uh, that we translated to but we also make uh, elaborated our own video with our local examples and um, we main and uh, to reach actors from diverse levels. So at the municipal, local, state and federal levels, but also in communities, uh, we reach it technicians and specialists and also decision makers. Okay, 
Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present our strategy. And I'm open to questions when Lily say I can I can answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer and Patricia, for the interesting case study um, and highlighting the important role of capacity building in ecosystem-based adaptation, the fact that it is context-specific, uh, it's very culture-oriented process, and it is also a learning process. So um, it is as ecosystem-based adaptation as such, it is such a learning process, and each component of it takes its own um, dynamic into this learning process. Thank you once again. Um, as I mentioned, we would have the questions uh, session at the end of, the, of all presentations. I would um, now give the word once again to Monica and her presentation. So if you could give me some seconds, I could go back to her presentation. Um, I would have to pass to the presentation of Jennifer. Here we are with the presentation of Monica Garcia Aguilar and as well Carlos Diaz Galindo who is also um, here in the in the webinar. So I would give the word to Monica now. Please if you could let us know about your interesting case study in Costa Rica. Thank you. Once again, experiencing some um, technical problems with the audio of Monica, and we will need to proceed with um, one of the other presenters we have uh, while we are able to resolve this problem. Many apologies. Um, I would I would like to come to one of the other presenters we have um, from Grenada, Kerisia. Kerisia Hobson uh, from the Ministry of Education, uh, Human Resources, Development and the Environment, uh, the Government of Grenada. Kerisia and, and um, her colleagues presented a re really interesting case study on building capacity for coastal ecosystem-based adaptation in small islands developing states. And it is our pleasure to hear more about this case study. I would um, now have to pass through the presentations once again. If you could um, just stay with us for some seconds while we reach her presentation. And we will come back to all the other interesting slides that you're seeing right now. So, if you by any chance have any questions, please write them down and um, we will follow with them in, in our session on questions. So here is the presentation and I would, I'm really happy to give the word to Caricia so she can share with us her experience from Granada. 
Thank you, Kerisia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I apologize, the webcam isn't working, so I hope that you can hear me okay. So we just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity to present today. Um, as Lily said, the name of the project that we've been working on is Building Capacity for Coastal Ecosystem-Based Adaptation in Small Island Developing States, which we call for short the Coastal EBA project. And we don't have all the logos and stuff on the presentation, so I want to take this opportunity to speak about the implementers. Uh, so it's a government of a Grenada along with the United Nations Environment Program and the project is funded by the European Commission. So we'll get straight into it. Um, our project is based in Grenada. It's a tri-island state and there are three islands, three main islands, and those three islands together have a square kilometer of 344 square kilometers and it's approximately 113,000 persons in, and the country is mainly mountainous and much of the population and all our assets are concentrated along the coast. So that's part of the reason why we were focusing our project on the coastal region. I will slow down. <laughs> so the the project has two main sites. One is on the main island of Grenada, and it's based in the Grand Dance Bay, which is the main tourism hub of the island, and it's where the most famous beach for the country is located, the Grand Dance Beach, and so the project is off that site. The second site is on the sister island of Karakou, and this area is known as Winwood, and the area is a traditional boat building community that is heavily involved in fishing. And so we selected these two areas to implement our EBA strategy. The overall aim of the project really was to help with the strengthening on a community level in terms of our understanding and our capacity to build our capacity to implement EBA strategies in general as part of climate change adaptation. Uh, we decided to focus on the benefits that coastal ecosystems provide to tropical small islands, and that's the reason why we decided to implement a coral reef restoration program to really illustrate what EBA implementation could look like in our context. We highlighted the role of coastal ecosystems and the roles that they play for coastline protection, for shoreline protection, and emphasized the benefits that small islands receive from tourism and fisheries in particular, and the economic importance that they have, and how coastal ecosystems actually support those sectors. Therefore, we were hoping to demonstrate how EBA could be used to reduce coastal vulnerability, at the same time showing how it provides goods and services that are important to tourism and fisheries. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of what our implementation strategy or plan looked like, it's a little complex looking from the graph or from the, the picture. However, um, to highlight that the process really involved a lot of stakeholder engagement through consultations and, and community meetings, etc., and we wanted to ensure that we included our stakeholders in the decision-making process, and they felt that they were involved in the decision-making process. Uh, the components of the strategy really can be broken down into four parts. The active coral reef restoration, which was selected from the stakeholders as the strategy that we would implement. The spatial planning component, which is where we developed tools to help us with our planning and management of our ecosystem spaces, uh, to review and propose legal and institutional frameworks or, or structures to help implement EBA in Grenada, and to design and implement a monitoring system to allow us to track and assess the progress and successes of the implementation strategy. So a big part of the implementation strategy really was the active coral reef restoration. That's the part that truly allowed us to demonstrate to the country as part of our capacity building and our education and awareness raising what EBA could look like in Grenada. And so the 
this component had a number of phases involved in it. The first phase involved establishing the coral nurseries. A very big part of the program involved training community members to be a part of a coral reef restoration program. And they, were, they are currently employed in the program as a new skill set job set in Grenada called Coral Gardeners. Um, then another part of the strategy involved active replanting of, our, of select coral reef ecosystems here in Grenada. Particularly, we focused on the reef systems in the areas that we were working, so Grand Dance in Grenada and Windward in Karakou. There was a very large education and awareness component to this project, not as large as we would have liked it to be, but significant. And the communities were also very much involved in, in that component, so they are the ones who are responsible for teaching and training persons about EBA. Um, another component is the monitoring and evaluation. As I said, we are working on a monitoring system to allow us to track and assess the outputs of the project and the longer term outcomes. And the communities are very involved in that. We actually have a community-based data collection and monitoring system for them to be involved. And finally, uh, we have placed a lot of emphasis on the sustainability of the work that we are doing. It has started as a project. However, we are trying to transition it into a program. And so that would require us putting mechanisms and, and strategies in place to ensure that we're able to do that. And so the sustainability part of the project involves us developing financing and partnership mechanisms and exploring alternative livelihoods for the, for the communities so that they are able to continue to make economic gain from the work that we are doing. So as I said, monitoring is a big part of the program. We are a pilot, and so a lot of what we have done is designing new techniques, and we were trying to test them in the Grenada context to see what could work, what was not working, and how we can, how we would be able then to make it work better. And so the monitoring, we designed a monitoring system that was EBA specific, and as I said, it involves a community-based component. And so the persons employed in the program as coral gardeners are responsible for, they're responsible for collecting the data and handing it over to the government, and government will then be responsible through the various divisions, the relevant divisions, utilizing that data for decision making. But the wider monitoring system includes more indicators than just the ecological ones. We are also trying to monitor the social impacts of the project, what sort of changes we see in the communities and on, within the country at large in terms of our perceptions and understanding of ecosystem-based adaptation, and in particular, coral reef restoration and the benefits and provisions that it makes to the country, as well as on a political and institutional level. What sort of changes are we seeing in our planning context on a, on a state level? What sort of changes are we seeing or can we see um, in our management aspects, etc.? So how, do the, how does this project, how does EBA in the Grenada context contribute towards communities' adaptation? I think we can probably start by the alternative livelihoods that we've created through this idea of introducing coral gardeners as a skilled job category. It's important to emphasize here that we've spent a lot of time and effort into designing a training program for coral gardeners. So if you are going to be a coral gardener, there is a certain skill set that we anticipated that you should have. And using that skill set, we designed the training program, which we tested through the training of the coral gardeners that we, we employed and refined. And it's now something that we can use to train other coral gardeners here in Grenada and in any other country that would like to implement a program like this. The second thing is the education and awareness component in the sense that the challenge we face in a small island is that many persons, do, although we have a relationship with the sea, it's not 
a strong relationship in the sense that we don't really understand what happens in the oceans. And so part of the job of this project really was to try and bring to reality what is happening in our oceans and why it's important to our lives on land. And so a big part of the adaptation strategy was to educate the communities and the wider nation at large on how coastal ecosystems, and in particular coral reefs, when they are healthy and robust, how they are able to provide shoreline protection for us and to help us protect especially our homes, infrastructure, such as roads and all our other assets that we find along the coast. For instance, in Grenada, our main ports of entry are all along the coast. So these are things that we have to consider. And so through this project, we try to help educate persons and raise awareness on these aspects. We also looked at the skill set that we left with communities. Part of this adaptation strategy focused heavily on community-based adaptation. The idea behind it was that, let's say tomorrow, we asked communities to be able to replicate something like what we have currently. They should be able to do that. And that's why we spent a significant amount of resources training and equipping communities with the skills necessary to be able to run effectively a coral reef restoration program in their area. And so that's one of the really key measures that we left with them. So on a broader scale, understanding what ecosystems are, it's something that we really tried to do through this project. Um, so working with the communities and really getting them to understand how fisheries, how their livelihoods as fishers are tied to coral reef ecosystems, how the protection of their homes and other assets are tied to coastal ecosystems. And so we worked really hard with the communities to build that awareness and equip them with the tools necessary for them to be able to teach other people about this. I should probably mention at this stage that we also introduced this concept of ecosystem-based adaptation to the wider Caribbean community, Caracom, and other small islands within the Caribbean region. And recognizing what we've done, a number of the countries are interested in using what we have done here in Grenada as an opportunity to learn in their countries and replicate some of this work in their countries. So we're actually currently discussing the design and implementation of a regional project. In terms of policy and mainstreaming of EBA, we've been working with a number of the other partners here in Grenada who are developing policy documents and other planning documents. And in particular, we've worked along with the preparation of the National Adaptation Plan. Grenada is significantly advanced in the preparation of this plan. And we've worked along with the, with the team to ensure that EBA is front and center in the plan. Um, the overarching framing of the National Adaptation Plan for Grenada includes EBA as well as some of the various sectors, program sectors for the NAP include EBA as key items. We are also currently working on a coastal zone management policy, well, a plan or an act rather, legislation for a coastal zone and EBA is been given strong consideration, especially in terms of how we manage our coastal ecosystems and the activities that would help to protect and conserve those ecosystems. We are also updating our climate change policy, and there are a number of other policy documents on a national level that we're working on, and we try to ensure that EBA is included. So currently, Grenada is also working on its sustainability plan, sustainable development plan, and EBA is also going to be included as part of that plan. So finally, coming towards, as we wrap up, the lessons learned from this project. There are a number of lessons that we learned, a lot of it tied to the gaps that we would have recognized. As I said in the beginning, this is a pilot project, and so there was a lot of scope for learning about what worked and what didn't work and what could work better. And so a lot of our lessons revolved around that. One of the key lessons that we learned is, the, is that projects need to be a little more flexible, especially when we're talking about working with nature, in terms of how funds are allocated or the budget that we're 
were assigned, even the timelines that we were assigned, a lot of delays in the project resulted from the fact that nature could not be rushed and we had to work with nature's timeline. And of course that meant that we could not keep the schedule that we would have hoped to keep. Uh, it was also important to note that in the design of the project, for instance, a clear understanding of what coastal ecosystems mean in small islands needed to be refined more. So it was very clear through the implementation of this project, for instance, that we cannot tackle coastal issues in a small island setting without tackling land-based issues. And the design of the project did not allow for us to reinterpret the scope of the project in such a way that we would be able to address those issues. We did, however, try to work along with other projects working on, on with the state on other activities that are working on land-based issues to try and mitigate the, their effects on the coastal environment, but it would have been nice to be able to address it holistically in a very integrated way through the implementation of such a project. And moving forward, it is something that we are looking, we are looking at actively. The second lesson that we learned is that there needs to be a framework, an institutional framework that facilitates this type of work. So we're working strongly with communities now. However, in our context, there isn't sufficient infrastructure to support this sort of work. And so we know that we need to address it more actively, if not through this project, through other initiatives in the country or just on a general state level. We are convinced now of the importance of stakeholder engagement and consultations in the impl implementation of any EBA strategy. A lot of these strategies are implemented directly in communities and the involvement of communities have been really instrumental in the success rate of the project to date, as well as the engagement of all other stakeholders, identifying as wide a base of stakeholders as possible and involving them in the decision-making process has really allowed the country to claim the work of the project and allow communities to feel empowered to act, and that has been a really big um, lesson from this project. We were forced to address this, the issue of data management in the country, and so we noted from this project that accessibility of information, key relevant information, is really important for decision making, and so we now know that we need to Oh, it has been reiterated the need to address how we manage data in the country and how we allow it to be accessible for implementing projects and making decisions in the country. We know also that we need to do more research on, on coral ecosystems, coral reef ecosystems in general. Uh, unfortunately, because of the budget constraints, the budgetary constraints that we had, we were not able to do as much scientific research as, as we would have liked on, for example, how the coastal, how the coral reef ecosystems function, um, what was the, so we've done some basic genetic, um, or some initial genetic testing on the fragments that we have in our nurseries and that we are out planting, but in terms of whether or not the genetic strains are really resistant to climate, climatic changes and other, are able to withstand the human effect, etc. Those things we were not able to do in depth. And so as moving forward, it's something that we need to strengthen in the project to really get a better understanding of how the climatic events and anthropogenic events are affecting the coral reefs in Grenada. In terms of the longer term success of the project, we know that we must have some sort of financing mechanism in place to allow the work to continue. If the project does not transition into a program, then there are there's no guarantee that the gains that we've made through the project will be able to continue. And so we know now that we must really emphasize the financing aspect in terms of sustainability. So thank you very much. I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Caricia. Um, it was really interesting to hear your experience in Granada, pointing out some very important lessons learned on the need for 
an institutional framework to support uh, efforts on implementing and mainstreaming ecosystem-based adaptation, as well as the importance of integrating or engaging and while well, integrating as well the points of view of stakeholders and engage them in implementation of all the activities possible in the project. Um, as well, it was very interesting, you mentioned that nature has its own timeline and yes, this is certainly an issue that needs to be taken in consideration in planning processes for EBA projects. Um, well, it was very interesting, you mentioned that um, ecosystem-based adaptation approach in, in CARICOM, in the Caribbean region, um, kind of takes more and more interest um, and it is a, kind of a, a common interest and it provides an opportunity for um, exchange of knowledge in between the, the, the islands and as well with technology transfer. So we are looking forward to hear more how this process is, is happening. Um, at this point, um, we have the very good news that uh, Monica, with her case study in Costa Rica, uh, will be able to present and the uh, audio problem has been resolved. So I would go back uh, again to her presentation. Um, I will need to scroll through uh, all the slides we, we passed. Um, please apologies, but this is also an, an opportunity for you to just look again and if there is any information that um, you are not able to, to, to read uh, during the presentations to just have a look once again. So if you could give me just some, um, a, a short moment to go to the presentation of Monica. Thank you. I'm really glad to give the word to Monica. Thank you, Monica. Good morning. I think you can all hear me well. I'm sorry. Sorry for the problems that we had with connection. We will try to see if we can just go fast and talk about the presentation of the project. My name is Monica Garcia. Um, I'm first an engineer by the University of Madrid and I did my final career project, a, a project with the co Spanish cooperation, the Institute of Development of Costa Rica and the University. My project is called Proposal for Adaptation to Climate Change Based on Ecosystems for the Bribri Indigenous Territory of Costa Rica. In the presentation, uh, I mentioned Carlos Diaz, who is a co-worker here in Spanish Cooperation in Costa Rica, who will be in this webinar, and he will help us to mention, to talk about some things, since he was directly working on the project. The context of my case study starts with a project, project that is called The Rural Environment Facing the Challenge of Climate Change in Costa Rica, which is a project that was financed by INDEPT for the Spanish Cooperation and the Adaptation Fund, fund which started two years ago, and it's in the framework of uh, a law, a law of the government of Costa Rica, where 1936, where we established, established a framework for establishing for the formulation, planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the state interventions in rural development. The territory that we chose was the Talamanca Valle de la Estrella territory, which will be presented uh, on a map. 
The main objective was of the, of the, of the, uh, the main objective was to strengthen the territory's capacity to adapt to the effects of climate change in the productive area and the risk management. It was a matrix project, quite wide. It had a lot of components. Main, uh, m most of them were a component of livestock in banana and, and agroforestal component and the indigenous people component that we will be uh, working with. The beneficial population was 36 producers and the families, 36 producers, that was going for a period of, a period of three years, which is, has a, it is the duration of the project, and with a population of 228 beneficiaries. The context we are now in indigenous territory is that climate change effects are even more severe and we can, can find severe drops and increased rainfall provoking floodings, especially in the raining zones and that leads to lack of quality in the production. This is a territory with uh, it has a, that has a low um, human development in this country. We have also laws of ancestral practices, inclusion of monoculture of banana and ban of banana, and that leads to loss of culture and loss of some agricultural practices. We have also a uh, a lack of the main lack of the main sales of the products, which is the banana, the the, the cacao and that makes the population a vulnerable population facing the climate change and we gather information where we had loss of productivity of the families of 40 percent causing food safety a risk the context of the case study of the bravery is here in the frontier almost with the panama country as we can see at the top left image would be the territory on orange in the lower image near the Caribbean Sea. The other territory in blue are the territories of Costa Rica. On the top right we see a map of the flooding where the red part shows a high risk of flooding. The violet is a moderate risk and the rest of the territory a mild risk. But as we can see the black points are indigenous country distributed around the territory and the the joint point of the rivers are on the red and the violet zones that's which explains the risk of flooding. In the lower image we can see a plantation of banana monoculture that causes a lot of problems. Whether in the environment and cultural that is what we want to face. As for the uh, focus and the objectives of the implementation ABA measures, our objective was to facilitate the adaptation of the Bribri community to climate change through the integral management of its productive system using agrobiodiversity and ecosystem services. The indigenous territory, Bribri, had culturally a traditional way of managing the productive spaces, as we can see in the lower images, the Huito, Teito, and Chamuyo. And they're different since the Teito is where they cultivate the basic grain, Chamuro is where they have the commercialization products, mainly cacao and banana combined with woods and fruits and with we find the lower animals with medicinal uh, plants and other practices. That's why that is the system that we try to strengthen and to recover as a practice of adaptation to climate change. The focus was to rescue 
and as this was knowledge, understanding the indigenous form as an integral form or agroecosystem, where we could have the uh, ecosystem-based adaptation practices. In the lower part, we can see a neoforestal system and proper of the indigenous people of different streets, and it will be one of the first measures that we will uh, deal with. Part of the measures of adaptation that were implemented most important were the rescue and settlement of indigenous ancestral practices that they had throughout the days and that were proposed but that, that provided quite benefits as for rotation of soils, creole seeds use, work with different working with the phase the moon phases. We opted for diversification on endemic species on their use, all the productive systems as we saw in the images. We opted for the selection and introduction of crops that represented good responses facing drought and flood situations of the territory. As for the production, commercial production, we tried to get to that optimal certification in order to support the banana and the cacao through projects of forest nurseries we we gave the seeds of more important species for the indigenous community in order to increase the coverage of the forest and to increase the surface which would cause a ben which which would benefit directly to the population we opted for uh, the conservation, protection, and regeneration of the indigenous forest species. And since there were some abandoned spaces, and we tried to convert those spaces to secondary forest. We also supported the agroecological practices as part of the um, cultural practices. We carried out uh, training. For example, the use also of organic fertilizers, greenhouse constructions for fruits and vegetables, different systems for water collection, and in the farm where we had some animals, we tried to implement the rotational grazing system. Regarding the monitoring these impacts of the EBA, as I mentioned, was a project in execution, the horizon in order to see the results where we're going to be seeing in three years. First, we will try to measure the recovery and dissemination of ancestral practices in the whole territory. We will try to measure an increased number of biodiversity and of species in every indigenous productive system, that those uh, crops introduce our resistance to drought season and flood season. The agroforestry systems with greater cocoa and banana um, banana production. We will try to see uh, an increased number of hectares protected under the payment for environmental services, that the population train in agricultural practices and that in, in implementation on farms. and the farms with sustainable livestock production. As for the contribution to of measures or EBA, we were trying to look among the benefits. We focus on the social and cultural benefits, mainly the social and cultural benefits for the population. An increase in the food security, increase of diversity of, of products. Quite important, the conservation, preservation of local knowledge and species, and the management of economic systems. As for the economic benefits, we always try to look for the introduced species or potential, where potential sources of income at the local level, whether with a, a seed farm, avoiding dependence of external market, and partial loss. 
and partial loss of production, which is quite uh, proper of indigenous country, meaning that they are not very used to have a accounting of what is production, and there is a there's a lo meaning that there is a, a great loss of production, and that is what we wanted to 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 solve and raise awareness on this. As for the environmental benefits, we were trying to uh, create a conservation of genetic diversity, a recycling of products within the farms. Since it was an agroecosystem, we were trying to uh, create a reduction of greenhouse gases in the territory with the introduction of certain species resistant to uh, drought or sodding, we were reducing to the re exposure time to uh, extreme events and other activities regarding this. Many apologies. Um, do you hear me? Uh, we just... Um, just a second, I'm having a, a little technical problem that we are trying to resolve with Monica. Let me see if I can connect once again with her. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Great, I will continue. Sorry. It's just that I lost the slide. I was talking about the three benefits in which we base our adaptation measures. And as for the incidence of of the project, the policy advocacy on EBA, the project was part of the Rural Development Plan, which considered adaptation and also the territory from the point of view of the climate, taking into account this scenario of climate change, specific, which are specific for the territory and the part of Costa Rica that before I didn't mention, but we're previewing an increase of 2 and 3 degrees in the temperature. The cold future is in areas and a decrease in of rain. In 10 and 20 percent. We proposed the inclusion of vulnerability concepts of climate change to the public policies as well as the uh, as well as trying to look at the mechanisms to adaptation plans as for example payment for environmental services in the indigenous territory we had a cultural context of conservation we had to find a balance between that and the preservation of ecosystems. For that, we have to understand the ecosystem in the economic context at the time of adapting those measures, and the public policies have to have an engagement with the following and assessment of results and long, medium, and short term. Lessons learned of our project is that the measures of adaptation for this search, we have to be a product of a process uh, research, a participatory research process in order to create a good impact on the population and especially more importantly, especially when we are talking about indigenous territories. The analysis of different alternative adaptation has to be done from the point of view of the climate. That is why it is very important to work with these map scenarios, climatic map scenarios. We have to try to know the potentiality of this each territory now before starting with these measures. For that, we have rural development processes that are framed by the law. The technicians that should be there with the producers should know the, the media. In our case, we work with indigenous population in order to do to make the process easier. The process of with the farms, diagnosis, recovery on farms, it, quite, it is also quite important the participation of all population, of all community in this project. In our case, we try to value the ancestral practices of the indigenous 
trying to make them see that they were the, the seed for their own development. Before I start a new project, and we pass a releasing civilization project regarding vulnerabilities and the impact of climate change on the territory, since the indigenous population is not very used to deal with those concepts. They wanted they actually saw that where that we had so that we had flaws and drops but didn't uh, make the relation between that and the measures they had to adopt. The national adaptation policies of adaptation of climate change have to be articulated and taken to the territory real strategies in order for the population to be able to adapt as well as to look for the population of coordination population uh, the population so they can coordinate it is quite important, as we saw in our case, to work with short-term results in order for the population to continue to continue progressing. Why? Because when we talk about climate change, we expect for long-term results when we talk about uh, tree species. So it is quite important to involve the population in other different levels, different stages, to engage them. And I think that would be all from my part. I hope you were able to listen to me and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, it was really interesting to hear all your experience on um, collecting traditional knowledge and how ecosystem-based adaptation can be a solution as well. Um, as we saw so far, and not only for coastal ecosystems, but we see for agroecological solutions uh, where climate change has greatest impacts as well. Um, thanks once again. Uh, we have uh, two more presentations. Um, one is the presentation from Peru, from Brendan Lutt, um, from Starfish Alliances on biochar for sustainable soils. And as well the other one from Cuba, which is um, presented from Fruilan Duenes Perez, uh, from the Environment Unit and Meteorological Center for the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation and Environment in the Matanza province in Cuba. Um, and the case on promoting ecosystem-based um, ecosystem adaptation in Cienegala, the uh, Maiguiar wetlands, and the coastal area of the Marti municipality in the, in the Matanza province. Um, unfortunately, both presenters were not able to connect um, to the webinar, um, and especially in the case of Cuba, um, it was uh, impossible because of the internet um, configurations there. So we are um, exploring opportunities to have their videos of their presentations recorded and possibly um, then share them with you and also uh, with the community of practice on EBA. So many apologies on that and as I mentioned um, the details on their presentation on their case studies would be further on um, pub published in um, in a publication uh, with all the 10 case studies finalists um, of our EBA regional context. Um, at, well, at this point, um, I would like to thank Jennifer, Monica, and Caricia for their um, kindness and availability and willingness to present in our webinar. We have um, we have a session on questions, and I already received several questions. So from the audience. Thank you for the interesting questions. Um, I can start at this um, time with some questions for Monica. Um, so one of the questions come from the Josefa, Josefa Rojas Perez. She has two questions. Uh, one is on what has been the participation of women, indigenous women, in, um, in the agroforestry system community uh, with which you worked, and the other one is um, what ecosystem uh, services have been generated from the project. Another question for Monica as well is uh, coming from Caricia. Uh, if she can elaborate a bit more on how 
um, you went about attempting to value the ecosystem services you mentioned. So this is for the moment the questions uh, for Monica. I will come back then to also the other presenters and the questions for them. So Monica, thank you. Uh, floor, so I will try to answer the questions. I think the first question is related to to the participation of indigenous women in the agroforestry uh, systems of the community. Well, relative to, as for the, 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 the indigenous women, the, the Brebe indigenous country is a community where historically the women have had uh, great participation in the whole uh, field activities, not only refer to a reforestal reforestry system, but also the the characters in the farm. So whether it's the the planting or, or anything or production in, in, in the cacao and banana production, women have a great a great active participation in the process within the farm. We had a lot of farms, uh, between five and, and ten hectares that were actually managed by women, so I think that is the, my answer to the, your question, I hope. As for the, the ecosystem uh, services, what we tried to do was to generate once more those services since they had had them before in order to put them to, to value them and to provide them with adaptation capacities facing climate change so what we tried to do was to create more resilient farms using that biodiversity of the farms the different functions of the part of the products of system, subsystems where we were able to find all ecosystem services. And the question to value the ecosystem services, I think, I, I didn't actually understand the question, but yeah, we worked we did a lot of field work with participative activities where almost all population was involved in those and they were the ones who strengthened and put in and, and valued those practices. We also generate a manual of good practices uh, and it was done by indigenous people and that was spread by all the territory schools to people to schools to people that have the farms you need to value those those knowledge that knowledge and I don't know if you have any more questions maybe Carlos could uh, my, 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 my partner in the project who will also work in more technical parts of the project could help us with some other questions some other answers somebody is right in there. What ecosystem uh, ecosystem system services for Costa Rica by diversity the protection of rivers with native species. We try to strengthen that. We try to strengthen the use of certain indigenous species with good roots and that support it that tolerated the flooded the floods on the sides of the farms that avoided those floodings the floods the, that avoid that those floods affected the soil. I don't know if that answers the questions. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Monica will ask the question in Spanish. Uh, question for Caricia is regarding the evaluation of uh, 
ecosystem services if we use traditional knowledge in order to to support that process of assessing assessing the ecosystem services that we took into account in the project. I don't know if you or Carlos could um, elaborate on that regarding that aspect. I understand that as for the knowledge, indigenous knowledge, for we, by women were used to to realize those adaptation measures using the ecosystem services and so my answer would be that practically almost all uh, adaptation measures were participatory they were elaborated in different diagnoses and we gave a lot of priority to the local knowledge of population in that sense, yes. I don't know if I am answering your question, but, but Carlos, I think he can say something. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Carlos, for helping with the um, answers in, on the chat. I have one question for Jennifer, and and there's an, some other questions for Monica. We'll continue. Jennifer, there's a question from Gemin Money. And the question is if there is some sort of strategy to do a follow up to the results of the trainer training. And to see if the results of the project were also applied. So, Jennifer. You I see that there has been some little problem with connection with Jennifer. Um, I have... Oh, alright. So, um, Jennifer, the question, if you could hear me, is um, if there has been any strategy in order to, to monitor what has been the results from the courses that uh, you have um, implemented, um, and in order to see whether those, the knowledge um, has been applied. So I, I would give you the, the word now. I hope it's... Um, it is uh, unfortunately not possible to connect to Jennifer. Maybe and she can respond to the question through the through the chat. I can just uh, add um, something as a response to Carissia, uh, to her question on the valuation of the ecosystem services. Um, it is where Carlos is giving us a bit more information that as an indicator um, for the ecosystem services, uh, the project considered the number of um, species uh, new species that have been cultivated, but it hasn't been taken into consideration the, um, the, the evaluation um, of other indicators. So I hope this um, this gives an answer to Carissa's question. Uh, I see that Jennifer is back, so uh, I will give her the floor again. Uh, can you repeat the question for me, please? Lily. 
Yes, of course. The question is whether um, you have taken in consideration um, a strategy in order to monitor what have been the impacts or the results from your capacity building activities, so to see whether um, they have been implemented and, and how. So have you had this in mind? And if you could elaborate a bit more on this aspect. Thank you. OK. so. Um we uh, have some some activities of um, coaching with our uh, uh, participants and the trainers uh, because our main goal is to um, consider EBA in uh, public policies and in territorial planning instruments. We uh, we uh, work together with the people that participate in our courses and that are uh, trained by our courses to actually um, use their knowledge to do that, to consider EBA in, in planning and in policies. Uh, our project uh, goes to uh, ends. Actually, our project have two um, parts. It's the first one is tech, uh, technical with GIZ, and other is uh, financial with KFW. With GIZ, our project ends at uh, March um, next year, and KFW goes to ends in 2020. Um, so we will have uh, financial activities from KFW to um, elaborate territorial instruments, and we are going to use the knowledge uh, that we offer to our participants and the trainers. We're going to use their knowledge on this uh, elaboration uh, to elaborate these this territorial instrument, instruments. Um, also, uh, we try with our strategy to have institutions that appropriate EBA. Uh, one uh, example, a good one, is the uh, Federal Institute, Institute of Paraná and uh, the State University of Paraná. We have two professors in each institution that are trainers, and they inst um, they appropriate EBA inside their institutions. So we hope that with uh, uh, our help and ending the project, they can um, they can continuing um, giving courses and using their knowledge in their workplace. Um, another point is our NAP, our National Adaptation Plan. Um, we have a different department here in the Ministry of Environment that are going to implement our NAP and they, are, they also participated in our uh, strategy and they're going to continue in off offering courses. But uh, mainly, I think the, the, um, the, the best activity for, for uh, after the project finished, uh, we are having this online learning course that we are developing right now. And it's going to stay uh, available in the ministry platform after the project ends. So we're hoping with that to continue this process of learning and the strategy can go on even with the uh, uh, project end. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for, the, for your response. Um, and uh, I have another question uh, which is for Caricia. It is uh, from Carlos Galindo Diaz. Um, he is um, asking, well, without any doubt, um, that it has been taken into consideration. The, oh, sorry, the, the question is for Caricia. Yes, so it's without any doubt there has been taken in consideration the, the, the scenarios of increasing uh, sea level. Uh, which has been estimated for um, for 21st century, for the end of 21st century, to come between 0 0.26 centimeters and uh, 0 0.53 centimeters. Um, so, 
if, if Clarice could uh, let us know how this has been taken in considerations and what, what, have, what are the challenges with um, this kind of uncertainties in, in developing projects, um, especially in the Caribbean region. Thank you. Um, maybe I should say that when we started the project, we actually started with the production of a vulnerability, a national vulnerability assessment, where we took into consideration all climatic data that was available at the time, including sea level rise. So we used the modeling to produce scenarios for 0.5 meter and 1 meter sea level rise across the country, across the coastal region of the country, and other factors in terms of which areas had interventions and which areas were highly degraded. A number of different aspects were taken into consideration and we used that to build a national picture of what our coastal vulnerability looked like. Um, and once we had that, we used that data to select the two sites that we were going to work in. So for example, the two areas that we're working in are by no stretch of the imagination the most vulnerable areas in Grenada. However, a number of the other heavily vulnerable areas already had intervention strategies being implemented, and so we just selected the next two on the list where we were able to work. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Caricia. Um, it is indeed uh, it is indeed interesting to know um, about the vulnerability and risk assessment um, on a national level um, in Granada. So it's, it, thank you for sharing uh, this information. There is one more question, um, which is for Monica. Uh, it comes from Whitman, Whitman Machado, uh, and he's asking um, in order to develop the uh, adaptation actions that were presented in, in, in your project, um, whether there has been studies on vulnerability and, and risk um, in the area. So if you could elaborate um, if you had this considered in, the, in your project and how it has um, been incorporated. Thank you, Monica. Regarding vulnerability, at the beginning of the project, we were with clim climate scenarios, and especially the scenario, the possibility to of having floods in the territory. Since we saw that was what, what affected the most the situation of indigenous communities, and that's why that maybe many of the adaptation measures were focused to, to the severe troughs and floods. And the other climatic situations that we s were able to see in the territory that were proved by those uh, climatic scenarios in the short term. And I think those were the two vulnerabilities that we worked with regarding the, the, the search for adaptation measures and especially the, the, the floods. I think that I think I answered the question that I must highlight where the two main vulnerabilities that we face in the indigenous territory. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, also, Carlos Diaz is um, mentioning that in the Institute of Meteorology in Costa Rica, uh, there are studies and maps on risks for um, floods and droughts. So it, they have been used as a reference uh, on a different scale in the, in the project in order to um, develop and design the, the EBA measures. So thank you very much both <laughs> for complementing the answers. Um, with this, I hope we have uh, responded all questions. Um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot to Monica, to Jennifer, and to Caricia.
and uh, for their presentations. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, we hope we will receive videos from our two presenters um, on their cases in Peru, from Brendan Latt and from Florian in Cuba, so we can share them with you. Oh, we see that Brendan has just joined the webinar. Um, so I hope we can um, count with his presentation uh, possibly for our next webinar. Um, as right now we are unfortunately out of our time schedule with this webinar. Um, and well, it has been really an exciting experience to hear from all those case studies in the region, in Latin America and in the Caribbean, and it's our uh, um, pleasure as well to share them both in Spanish and in English to try to overcome the language barrier. We, we will share with you all the presentations and as well the, the recorded videos and as well the contacts of, of the presenters, so if there is um, any need for more clarification and any questions, um, you have further on, then you can contact them. Uh, with this, well, I, I take the opportunity to invite you to our next webinar, which will take place on next Tuesday, on in 11th of July, uh, and the same time between 10 and 11.30 in, in the morning in Lima time. Uh, and the cases from uh, Peru, Mexico, uh, and La um, Mesoamerica or Central America uh, will be presented um, in our next webinar. So thank you very much once again uh, also for your patience uh, with some of the technical problems and uh, we will follow up with you. Thank you and have a nice day. Goodbye.